we're super happy to have Ken Stanley here today to virtually present to us. Um, he is a pioneer of open-endedness and machine learning and co-authored the book, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, which is very often recommended by people in our lab. So definitely go read that. The book goes into why open-endedness might lead to better solutions than direct optimization. And one of the many works by Ken that you might know, and I won't go over all of them in the interest of time, but is Needs and Hyperneeds, uh, a method of evolution in artificial neural networks, which won an outstanding paper of the decade award in 2017. And others include Pullet and Minimal Criterion uh, Coevolution, um, also known as MCC. In his own words, Ken is currently deciding his next adventure after most recently leading a research team at OpenAI on the challenge of open endedness. So we're definitely excited to learn what the next adventure will be. And today he'll talk to us about novel opportunities in open-endedness. So take it away, Ken. Okay, thank you. And thanks for having me here. Um, I know that you guys do a lot of great work that's related to my interests. And I'm really excited to be able to share some ideas with you that I think um, are maybe less uh, less discussed in the field. So what I thought was that, you know, I, there's some stuff that I talk about often that's sort of usual stuff in open-endedness. Um, but I thought I'd talk about some things that are more unusual here, because I think that generally uh, this this group is, is pretty uh, up to speed on the field of open-endedness and open-ended learning. And I think that it would be really interesting to talk about some things that get very little attention. Um, so this is more unusual. So I chose these two topics. I think they're both uh, really important, um, and uh, but they're probably also unfamiliar. And one is the impact of open-endedness on representation, and the other will be uh, the role of what I'm calling conditional invention in open-endedness. So it's basically two disconnected parts. So part one. This is a reminder for a lot of you. A lot of you already know this. Some of you don't know, so it's hard for me to calibrate this, but I don't want to like rehash this in too much depth because I know that a lot of people have heard of this. This isn't the main point, but I need to give it just a little bit of background um, to make the point I'm going to make about representation. So this is going to be about representation. But first, I just want to show you an old experiment, which is pick reader, just to, to refresh a lot of your memory, uh, what this was, because this will lead into the representation point, which is, I think, very important. Um, so pick reader was this old website that we put up uh, when I was a professor. Um, and uh, we, um, we basically put it on the web so people could breed pictures is pretty much what it says. So what does that mean? Like if you wanted to breed like blobs that from scratch, you'd get an interface like this. And I'm gonna give a little technical detail here because this is a technical audience. So just, just so you know, like what is generating these images is that each image is a separate neural network. So this is not like a normal generative system of the type familiar today in sort of modern technology. This is something uh, unusual, which is that like there's a single neural network which only produces a single image. And I'll show you the details of how. So you're looking at right here really 15 different neural networks. And we just pick, the, or pick our favorite or what we wanna see more of. So we could say, I choose that one and then I'll have children. And this is just perturbations of its weights, random perturbations. So basically these are offspring. Um, and then I could just play this is like a little game, right? I could play this game. I could choose that one because that one looks the most interesting. So let's see what kind of children that has. And as, as I've many times shown this before, like it, it, at, the, at the beginning, this looks like a very modest little game that you could play, but actually it's quite interesting because eventually you get to these kinds of things. Um, users who are using this online would find all of these, which I've often tried to claim is pretty remarkable um, that they're finding these. One reason that this is remarkable is because these are extreme needles in a haystack. This is not the majority, or this is, this is an infinitesimal minority of the space actually. Um, and of course they look like familiar things. And so it's interesting how people were finding these things. Um, and so to give a little extra uh, detail, uh, just so you know what's under the hood, because we're going to be talking about representation, what is behind an image like this is, is this kind of a network. And I call this a compositional pattern producing network, which is like a whole topic in its own right. These were invented for an independent reason. Basically, they were invented to be able to generate structures with regularities and symmetries. Um, I was interested at the time in uh, how um, like DNA actually can represent things like, like uh, 
the phenotypes that we see in nature. And CPPN was somewhat of an abstraction of the ideas that are in DNA. So it's, it's quite a, its own involved topic, but that's not all that important for this purpose. For this purpose, let's just think of it as a kind of a neural network, um, a kind of a neural network with special activation functions, which basically cause symmetries and regularities. Like the, like the sine function gives you uh, periodicity and the Gaussian function can give you symmetry and so forth. And so a composition of those will tend to create something that has geometric regularities. These are those canonical functions in the CPPN and everything else just weights like weights in a normal neural network. Um, and uh, the inputs though are basically the, the coordinate that you're querying. So it's not like you just output a whole image at once. You basically have to sweep this across the space, the, the image space and get every pixel independently. And you'll get an HSB, like a color value at the output. D is a, like a special um, input that was added to uh, give a little bit of bias towards uh, radial symmetry. You know, it's basically the distance from the center of the image. So it always knows for every pixel how far it is from the center of the image. Um, and this tends to give a nice aesthetic bias within this pick reader space. So that's all like, th these are these networks and like where they come from though, is that they're evolving through the NEAT algorithm. Um, which is like previous work I did actually, that was my dissertation work. Um, and that algorithm involves increasingly complex neural networks. So basically what it means for the purposes of the pick reader is that occasionally a new connection or a new node is added to the network. Um, and that will cause the networks to get more complex over time, which is why like when you see the early pick reader, you see these kind of formless blobs and later you see all these details, it's because the networks are growing. So they're getting more complex or the images are getting more complex. Um, and so like, this is just a little depiction of neat. I'm not going to go into the details of the algorithm. It doesn't really matter that much for these purposes, but basically it just gets from very minimal, no hidden node structures uh, to things that are more complex over time. And it, there's no bound to the amount of structure that can be added. And so that's happening during breeding. Now, again, to remind you, like the space that's represented here is, is actually desolate in the sense that most images look like this kind of junk. They have these these depictions are just random weights and topologies. Like you don't automatically get things like butterflies and cars uh, looking in this space. It's a very special parts of the space where you find those things. So these are basically needles in a haystack, uh, for real. And so it's interesting that people were finding them uh, very efficiently in the sense that like these are discoveries that are usually in in the course of maybe dozens of iterations of search. So you know you compare that to like deep learning stuff with you know, thousands, millions of iterations, maybe even billions. Uh, this is absolute peanuts, like it's tiny. Um, and so it's actually quite interesting that these things are being picked out in just dozens of iterations. And in a few uh, cases, it's hundreds of iterations, but that's about the most. Um, and so that's actually kind of remarkable. And um, I just wanted to give you one other, just like little piece of what's under the hood here is that there is what allowing, what's facilitating these discoveries is something called branching. Um, which means that like actually when you discover an image on this uh, in this little game, you can send it back to a website, the pick reader website, um, by pressing a publish button. And that would mean that other people can see it. And if somebody likes that image and wants to actually breed it further, then they can do what's called branching. They can just say, I want to continue from this image. So for example, like this face, somebody published this face, somebody discovered this face. But that means that I could just say, I want to continue from there. And I have my own independent branch now. And I can basically, I just get the old interface. And there's nothing new really happening here. It's just that I've decided to continue from a predecessor. Of course, that allows things to keep getting more and more complex, which is what's interesting. In effect, this is an open-ended process. It's divergent. There's no final goal. It's proliferating more and more discoveries over time. And every discovery is a potential jumping off point for more discoveries. So it's interesting in that sense. So just basically, you can evolve these just like you evolve the blobs. There's nothing different and you can publish. And so like what is um, overall over time, what is emerging here is what you might call a phylogeny, you know, and a biologist might call it a phylogeny, um, which is that um, we have this system where like, you know, this is the root of this particular phylogeny. This is only a small sub phylogeny of the whole site, but each one of these connections is like where someone had a session um, and uh, evolved something from something else or bred something from something else. And so it, this is like maybe 30 users about 30 users were involved in the collaboration that happened. It's an implicit collaboration because nobody talked to anybody else, but people are building off each other's discoveries. And so you get these phylogenies growing and at the leaves of this, to some extent, are tend to be the most complex and interesting things, which are, tend to be these things here. Um, and so these are the results after many branches, usually um, of people building on each other's discoveries. Um, and I think, you know, these are really nice, kind of remarkable things. Again, discoveries of just a few dozen steps often 
Um, and uh, if you look at sort of like the, the geometry here, it's, it's kind of remarkable. You think, well, what are the chances of certain things happening here? Like this handle on this pitcher, or look at the stem on the apple. The stem on the apple is uh, just uh, um, an asymmetric component on top of a symmetric component. Um, and so that's actually uh, impressive that this is just emerged um, from, uh, from, from people searching. This is not engineered in any way. And uh, the colors on this bird or this planet, like it's just, there's something I think remarkable about the efficiency of the discoveries that are happening in the system, um, given what's going on under the hood. And um, what we discovered, and this is still like not getting to anything that I would consider new here, this is just to give some background, what we discovered, uh, which was like a surprising insight that I think is actually profound um, and has very widespread implications beyond uh, even machine learning, beyond AI, um, even into just normal way we run society, is that like the stepping stones that lead to what you are interested in, if you consider the things on the right interesting, like a teapot or a skull, um, then the stepping stones that lead to them almost never resemble them at all. Like you could not predict that this, which is an egg with a hat, leads to this like teapot. Um, and that's just like the rule, not the exception. And so it's interesting because it means that like in order to get to this, like this discovery was essential, but the person who did discover this was not looking for this. You know, so in other words, you can only find things by not looking for them. Like if you were looking for teapots, you would not go to eggs with hats. And if you saw an egg with a hat, you'd try to go somewhere else. Um, and that means you couldn't find it. Like you can only find it if you're not looking for it. But the reason it was discovered ultimately was because the person who discovered this didn't care about teapots. And that's why teapots have been discovered. It's very counterintuitive. And so like the reason that I say that it has very like far reaching implications is because, you know, this is about uh, also how we um, guide discovery processes like in the, in the real world. Like it's not just about search algorithms. If everything is objectively driven, then this kind of deception is, is a huge pathology that we have to uh, deal with. Um, and of course, you could argue that pick breeder is special in some way, like, ah, the real world isn't like that, but that's not true. The real world does work like this. In fact, the real world is worse than this. Um, because just think about it, this is about complex search spaces. Of course they work like this. They wouldn't be complex if they didn't. Like if it's a simple search space, then the stepping stones do resemble the final product, but then there's no problems. We just know what to do. The problems are always when we don't know what to do. Those are problems we're trying to solve that are interesting. They're always going to have this property. Now, the reason for it, again, something simple is basically one, one term for this is just deception, which is just means that the things that actually are approaching where you want to go don't look like where you're trying to go. So it's actually deceptive. Like it looks like you're getting a donut here, but actually if you go down this path farther, you might find a skull um, and that's deception. There's, there's also the flip side of deception, which is that it might look like you're going in uh, the right direction, but it's actually wrong. That's also a serious problem. I'll actually see some of that later. Um, and so both of those are coming into play here. So now this is something, this is actually something old, but it's something new because it's something new because like most people have never even thought or heard about this, but it's really interesting. I think it's, I'm really glad to be able to share it with you. I'm trying to maybe resurrect a little bit of interest in this point, because I'm really curious what the implications for, are for deep learning and they have not really been investigated. Um, and so this goes back to a paper from 2011 that we wrote, which is called on the deleterious effects of a priori objectives on evolution and representation. And I'm going to extend this out and show why this remains relevant today and unexplored, but potentially very important. So, like, here's something that we did, which is something that that we that I thought would happen. Uh, for some people, this might be surprising, but I wasn't surprised by this. Which is this: we tried to rebreed these pictures. Like, if you think about the hypothesis that you can only find things by not looking for them, well, then this shouldn't work. Like, you shouldn't be able to rebreed these things by looking for them. Um, it's because of deception. So basically what we said is, okay, we're gonna use a target matching algorithm, basically we'll, we'll say, or image matching algorithm. So we'll compare images to these targets, the skull and the butterfly. And then we'll just choose from the set offered by pick reader, the one closest on every iteration. And you know, the hope would be if you believe in objective based sort of search then you should move closer and closer to the target and eventually get it, right? But of course it won't work because of deception. Now, in terms of like difficulty, we, we might think this is actually not difficult just because look, it only took 74 iterations to get to the skull, 90 to get to the butterfly. These are like tiny, tiny in, you know, in modern machine learning kind of context. And so like, how hard can it be to find things like this? It shouldn't be super hard. So we gave it 30,000 uh, iterations rather than like just dozens, just to be nice. 
Um, and of course, it, it like I said, it, it just doesn't work. Like these are the best things you get after 30,000 iterations and separate runs that we did. Um, it never it never works for these images like the skull and the butterfly. You can see it's trying. You can see sort of the, the, the broad out, outlines, but it can't get there. Um, and so uh, this is you know what we expect because of deception. The problem here is that as we pick things that look more and more like skulls, we're being deceived because actually they're not the stepping stones that lead to skulls the way this space is structured. Um, that's also true of butterflies and deception is a serious problem here. Now there's another kind of like a deeper issue, a subtle issue here, which I think is actually more interesting and, and, and kind of fascinating in a way, which is that like, if you think about this, this is actually like a critique of modern machine learning in terms of how it's practiced. Um, it may not immediately look like that, but just think for a second, like if you imagine for a thought experiment that the skull and the butterfly actually are benchmarks. So imagine that like, forget about like ImageNet, everybody wants to evolve a skull or everybody wants to evolve a butterfly. Those are like the pinnacle of achievement for an algorithm in this field. Now, let's just think about this for a second. Here we have a case where the underlying algorithm, which is neat, um, fails every single time. So like the usual way to interpret the result, this is just standard, is to say that, well, neat is not really up to the task. It doesn't do well, it doesn't perform well on these benchmarks, right? But like that doesn't really make sense here because like the only thing that's ever discovered these images, like the or original explanation for why they even exist is neat. So it's very strange to say, well, that actually neat is somehow like so optimal because it can't discover these when actually it is the only thing that ever discovered them. This is actually a serious problem, I think, with the interpretation of results. Um, the, the real thing that's going on here is that what need is good at in the context of an open-ended system is uncovering all kinds of interesting things, but not any one particular interesting thing. You have to make that distinction. Like an algorithm can be good at finding many things that are of interest to us, but it can be not good at finding any single thing that's of interest to us as a target. And there is nothing that we're doing in these kind of benchmarks to make, to dis, to make the distinction between, to, between those two types of cases. And this is a bit worrisome because it may be the case that the types of algorithms that succeed in an open-ended context are actually the most powerful types of algorithms because the open-ended open context arguably is the most interesting context for like AGI or something like that. So this actually leads to lots of controversy and actually pisses people off. I know, I know because of like when this paper came out, like, you know, there's a lot of people that are actually upset because like they didn't like this point um, that somehow like it undermines like the use of benchmarks. And I imagine there'd be some controversy here if we discussed it in depth, but that's actually not where I want to dwell. Rather, I want to go to something which I think is actually more interesting and sinister. Um, and this is where I think probably deserves uh, further investigation, um, which is that even if you succeed, representation is radically impacted by how you succeeded. This is very interesting and not discussed very much. Um, and so, first of all, I just have to um, let you know that you can succeed, actually, it turns out. It's just that the image has to be simple enough. If it's simple enough, then brute forcing it with neat can work. Um, and by the way, like you may be thinking, well, this is all about neat. That's like you know, old news. Like, what, what does it really mean <clears throat> for deep learning, like in the long run? But of course, it does have implications for deep learning also. So we'll get to SGD. Um, but just this, these experiments were originally with neat. <clears throat> and actually, neat is really helpful for illustrating this point because in neat, you can easily see inefficiency in representation because neat networks expand. As they, as they evolve. And so we can actually just see visually that like, actually, like if you discover this objective, which when it's simple enough that you actually can reproduce it reliably, which we call this thing the clown mouth, it's kind of like this, the, the pet name for this little image here, the clown mouth, that the, the clown mouth is, is much more inefficient in its representation if it's discovered as an objective. But look at the original discovery is actually one third the size in term, roughly in terms of you know, uh, nodes and connections. And this is consistent across all such rediscoveries. Like it's always like triple the complexity, something like that, or triple the size, um, if you rediscover it uh, as an objective, as opposed to the original open-ended discovery. You might call the open-ended discovery the natural discovery. You know, in some sense, it's like, um, it's kind of like nature. You know, like nature isn't aiming for targets like humans are not like a target that nature aimed for from the start. And so in some sense, it's like the natural way of discovering things is open-ended. It's like not actually trying to get to that thing as an explicit target. And so like the natural things tend to come out like way more efficient 
Um, and so uh, this just makes some sense if you really think about it. Like you tend to get spaghetti when you have intentional type of problem solving, like spaghetti representations, because all the thing cares about is like one pixel at a time getting more and more accurate. And that's just the wrong thing to be doing if you care about locking in the underlying regularities. Like that would be actually good representation. You know, like there's only a few regularities that actually describe the cloud mouth efficiently. And in some sense, they're really well locked in here. Like it's found the underlying symmetries and regularities in this image. That's why there's only, you know, like uh, seven weights or something in this entire network. That, but this thing here is just not finding the regularities. Rather, it worked on every patch independently in some sense and just created it through spaghetti because all that this sort of objective maximization cares about is that every single change you make gets you a little bit higher in some score. So it's going to lead to some kind of spaghetti. It doesn't care if you find the symmetry because it won't make the objective function look better. Um, it wouldn't reduce the loss. And so like basically it's not going to lock that in. So it doesn't care. So it doesn't care about finding these underlying regularities which lead to more efficient representation. This, this, this insight has been uh, also uh, reproduced in other kinds of very different domains. Like for example, evolving programs uh, through a novelty search versus an objective search, it's always more efficient if it's discovered through a novelty search, which is a, like also sort of more of an open-ended type of a, a search algorithm. Um, and so they, it, it, you can see in these kind of bloat graphs, like the top lines are graphs of during the course of search, uh, what happened um, to the, uh, the, the, the size uh, the average size of a uh, network, or, or sorry, programs in this case in the population. Um, and you can see that like on the top lines, we're looking at uh, like an objective driven target based search and on the bottom lines, we're looking at novelty search and it just bloats like crazy, like when you're actually trying to solve it as an objective. Um, and so like the more open-ended style leads to just a radically different type of um, dynamic in terms of representation building. Well, let's get a little insight into why. You know, like what exactly is going on when these weird representational uh, divergences happen? Um, and actually like the, the reason that this is happening is because objective solutions, as I alluded to earlier, they follow uh, very awkward stepping stones. Um, and you can see this like at the bottom here, like these are two discoveries of this eye. Now the, the eye is like right at the borderline of complexity where Nick can almost rediscover it pretty well. Like you can see, this is the rediscovery. It's not exactly correct, but it's close enough to be happy, I think. So this is kind of a, 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 a pretty successful rediscovery. And it's, I wanted to look at something sort of right at the borderline just because it's, um, it's about as complex as we can do without like just failing every time. Um, and so like what happens when you do succeed in this kind of a thing? Well, look at the steps. They're completely different. Like when we're doing it in the unnatural objective driven way, as opposed to the natural way. First of all, this is 12 generations, 12 iterations got this eye. This thing was get to 30,000 to get here. You might argue that this is good enough. I don't know, it depends on your opinion, but this is at around 3000, but this is 12. Um, and uh, this is just unbelievable. Like the, 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 the difference, the disparity and how long it takes to get to this thing. And that the reason is look at the stepping stones, they're wildly different. Like, the steps that you need to go through down that path to get to that final thing are going to be completely different. And the reason is because following an objective is a, another way of adhering to what's called the like causes like fallacy. The like causes like fallacy is something in philosophy, which says that the things that lead to the things that you're trying to get to look like them, they're like them. It's a fallacy. This is not always true. Of course, that goes back to my point about deception. You're going to be in a set, you're almost always in a deceptive search space in a complex problem. And so, like, of course, like causes like is a fallacy, but the objective function here is fundamentally just the like causes like fallacy being actually implemented mechanically in practice. And so you get this force that like says you have to always be making this look more and more and more like this thing. And it's completely unnatural from this representation. And that's why it takes so long to get to this point and has so much added complexity as opposed to this, which is not the like causes like fallacy. And this thing, each step along here was chosen only because someone found it interesting. They didn't know where it was gonna go and didn't care where it was gonna go. Nobody could know that they're gonna get to this and this, person or potentially more than one person who went along this trajectory in pick breeder, they were just playing. It was an open-ended discovery um, and therefore much more natural in terms of how it ended up with this representation. So it's this kind of a situation, this kind of a trajectory through a space that's nasty for representation, the underlying representation. 
Now, on the other hand, like when you don't find things through an objective, the representation is completely remarkable. I mean, there are some amazing properties of these things. Um, and I've still, I've always been just like blown away like by, by these uh, observations of these kinds of representations. Whoops, yeah. Let me get me myself an arrow here. Um, I'll turn off the word. Yeah, so, um, so here, if you look at this, um, this is the skull and this is its underlying representation. This is, a, this is the CPPN that represents the skull. It's kind of uh, nice because um, you can actually look at every individual node and depict it. Uh, you can render it because remember, everything is a function of X and Y. So every node is just renderable, uh, just like the final output. Um, and so we can look at like what's being drawn here and we see that like the way that things are decomposed is really uh, surprisingly intuitive. Like there's a head mask and then there's a, a, a mouth mask. Um, and the mouth is a function of the head, which makes sense because it's basically you know, situated within the head. And so it's like this thing is like modularly decomposing this image in the ways that a human might intuitively do it, which I find extremely surprising because there's no human ingenuity involved in this whatsoever. This is purely emergent organic representation. But even more kind of crazy here, like let's look at that connection. So the connection between these two nodes, which had a weight of 2.1, uh, which you know ultimately leads to the skull output, what happens if you perturb that connection? Well, it actually happens to be the mouth aperture. So it's like, you can find these all over the place in these networks. You find specific connections that lead to single intuitive dimensions of variation that a human would think, you know, makes sense with respect to this is a face, the mouth should open and close. So there's a single weight that does that. So you have basically a system like this and it's actually a smooth continuum. So to give you a, a sense of the smooth continuum here, look at this, uh, look at this apple. Um, this is actually uh, relatively larger than most images in terms of like the complexity, um, but uh, it has also, I think, amazing representation. It's already to me kind of remarkable that like this figured out how to make an asymmetric structure, which is the stem superimposed on top of a symmetric structure. Um, and you may, you would, I think if this was discovered say through SGD brute forcing it, I would be skeptical of if they're truly independent. I would just think this is just some kind of amalgamation that just looks like an asymmetric thing on top of a symmetric thing. But in this case, it's actually not just an illusion um, because we can sweep through a single weight uh, in this space and see like an absolute smooth continuum of the stem angle. This we call this the stem angle swing gene, which is this one connection uh, down near the bottom that's that you see uh, with the arrow pointing to it there. Um, and so uh, that's, um, to me, is just a, it's a remarkable property um, of these kinds of representations that they decompose in this modular way. Um, and it truly has separated the asymmetric part from the symmetric part and actually can swing it along an angle um, from a single weight. We find these all over. There's, we've written papers about just like these kind of things because I was just fascinated by this. But the real, but the issue here is what are the implications for deep learning? Now today, more modern context, um, we know, like I showed you that the objective evolution leads to kind of a spaghetti representation. Um, and so can we just dismiss that because it's evolution? Like it's not gonna happen in SGD. Well, no, like it does happen in SGD. Like I at least can tell you that because like we played with it because we were so curious about this. Like and it, it's what I would expect too. So it's not surprising. Like there's no particular force in SGD that you would think would force it towards like discovering symmetry and locking it in when it doesn't have to. It's just as amenable to spaghetti as evolution is. It's just that it's not adding new complexity over time. But yeah, you're still gonna get the spaghetti representation. So like what, what I mean by spaghetti here is imagine a butterfly like if you have these two wings that are symmetric, what you will find often if you try to just learn a single network with an XY input that outputs a butterfly is that like the two, went, the two wings are represented in independent parts of the network, which is inappropriate. Like it should recognize it's symmetric and only represent it once, but SGD will not do that. It's not guaranteed to do that. It's not likely to do that. Although of course, theoretically it can do that, but like through search, it probably will not do that just by chance. And so uh, you might ask then, well, is SGD different under certain conditions maybe? Like maybe there's some hope here. And I would say it probably is like, because like, for example, if I tried to train a network to output lots of different butterflies, not just one, you might be able to argue that like, well, it would need to get more efficient in its underlying representation in order to be able to generate all these variations. I think there's some, there's some credence to that argument, but it hasn't been explored in any, any depth. So I'm not, I wouldn't be totally confident in it either. And I'd also be a little worried that like, 
that that this is all just metaphorical, right? Like we don't care about getting networks that generate a single butterfly or ten butterflies. What we care about is networks that do extremely complex things, like today. You know, we might be looking at large models, and so like, is what that large model is computing analogous to trying to solve a single butterfly, or is it analogous to outputting lots of butterflies? You know, what could reassure us here? Um, and I think this is really not to, uh, at all studied. Um, and so I think this is, this is a, a real present worry. On the other hand, the open-ended discovery leads, leads to this fundamentally different kind of organization. And this is really an interesting insight. I think it explains to some extent DNA. You know, we have 30,000 genes in our genome, which are encoding trillions of cells, including 100 trillion connections in our brain. Uh, th this is incredibly efficient representation. How is this possible? Well, it's because it was discovered through an open-ended process. You know, if we had somehow discovered things like us through a target-based breeding process, you know, forget it. It would be it would require, you know, millions or billions of genes to get there. And that's not the world that we're in. And so like, you know, the, what we also see is that these, that DNA is also really cool as a representation underneath the hood. Like one word that like um, some biologists will use is this canalized, which means like if humans have a children, they still follow the general rules of children, even subject to genetic variation. Like they're all bilaterally symmetric. I've never heard of any, anyone born who's not bilaterally symmetric. That's a really deep rule. Now we do have birth defects, miscarriages and so forth, but they're extremely rare. And there's general, I've never heard of an account that was that your child was actually not bilaterally symmetric. So like these things we call canalized because like those things are basically respected, powerfully respected in the representation when you perturb it. This would not be the case of just arbitrary objectively discovered artifacts. Um, and so there's this question is should learned representations look like DNA? learned representations, like the things that come out of SGD, um, you know, through in, in sort of conventional scenarios, uh, th like, so I'm not just talking about evolution, I mean, in SGD, like, would it be better if they look like DNA, like in the sense that they, they have this kind of canalized property? Like you might argue, well, I don't really care about perturbation, you know, that's not really the problem, but perturbation is just, an, I think it's just a, a symptom of a larger issue, you know, because like what we do care about is that the things that we've learned are a basis for further learning. And then surely representation matters, right? Like if I don't understand that faces are symmetric, that would mean that I might have to independently discover that the eyes are symmetric from the fact that the ears are symmetric. Surely that's very inefficient. Um, and so like the, the fundamental insight of the symmetry coming first, it makes all of life better going forward. And the fact that that doesn't just happen automatically is I think a serious concern, which the implications are just completely unknown. I have no idea what that means. Um, like it may have implications for downstream learning that it may actually be making it much less efficient. It could even perhaps account for the fact that like these methods are so insanely data hungry um, because we're basically brute forcing our way through the fact that it does have such horrible representation just as a natural artifact of the way it's objectively being discovered. You might even ask like when we think like just as people, it's more speculative. But like, do you obtain representations that are different from people who don't think open-endedly? Uh, I think it's arguable that this could have a, be a factor in creativity, you know, because like you need a sort of a fundamental in infrastructure, like in, in the way that you represent the world in order to now come to new ideas. And so the way that you come to your understanding of the world, whether it was open-endedly or target-based could affect the organization of all of the ideas that you have and there will lock you in <clears throat> if you were a very objective thinker into something where you may look good on the surface, just like the rediscovery of the clown mouth is just as good as the original on the surface, but underneath the hood, it's not a good foundation for further sort of creative, like exploring further insights. Um, and so uh, that could be in, uh, partially explained to some extent why some people are more creative than others. It may be very early on that these kind of fundamentals are established, you know, because you need these things like the bilateral symmetry insight to then build other insights on top. And if you don't lock those in, the whole stack is screwed up from the beginning. Um, and so this is very interesting. Uh, and so overall, um, this part, I just basically saying, I don't really know. <laughs> like, I'm not saying this is like fatal flaw. We should all freak out. Uh, I don't mean to suggest like that, that, that the field is in any kind of peril. Uh, but I also just don't know uh, what it means. Um, and it might mean something important. Um, there's, it's not hopeless at all. You know, you can do open-ended like styles of search even with SGD. 
Um, deep learning does not suddenly get excluded because of this. Um, but the question is, should we? Should we be worried about it? Now, this is where it gets interesting because I know some of you are doing open-ended type of learning. And I think it's just interesting to think what's going on under the hood that's different than if some of these things were discovered in, in a way that was not open-ended and are there far-reaching implications? Don't know. Okay, so that's part one. And then the other part is something completely different, um, which I think hopefully is similarly of interest. Now, I want to refer to this new paper that we uh, published uh, in, uh, in June, just last month, actually, uh, which is called uh, Evolution Through Large Models. Um, but actually, I'm not going to just go through what the paper showed. That's not my pointer, but I just give you a little tiny pr uh, flavor of it before I go into the real topic, which is something more subtle. Um, but just to give you a little flavor of this, basically what we argued was that like this field of genetic programming, uh, which actually you may not even know much about genetic programming, it means evolving programs like with evolutionary algorithms. It's, it's not a very well-known field, um, but there is a little field like that. And it's actually got some problems. It's probably why it's not so well-known. It's got some challenges, which is that if you think about it, like uh, perturbing a program is, is a pretty dangerous business, right? Because like most just random perturbations, which would be the, the fuel for the mutation are probably devastating. And this is just a fundamental problem is that programs are not necessarily a natural substrate for doing perturbation. Um, like neural networks are better, you know, in some sense, because like we have lots of floating point numbers that we can just tweak like tiny bits. That tends to be like the smaller the tweak, the smaller the change. And so we can be safe in that way. The programs tend to be very discrete. Like if I change an X to a Y, that's like the end of the world. Um, and so it's hard. But what we showed here is that if you use a, a, like a, a large language model that's been trained on code, it completely changes that picture. So it's sort of, I think it's like an absolutely fundamental thing for this genetic programming field, which now I think makes it like much more, much more of a, a viable and serious method because suddenly we can say, make perturbations that are plausible to this thing because this, this model has seen perturbations you know, uh, in the millions. So it understands this. And so it'll actually make plausible program perturbations. And suddenly like what was like a kind of a science fiction-y thing is like actually totally realistic. Um, and it's a revolution for this area, I think. Um, and so it's kind of fun then, because then you can evolve programs like much, much more efficiently. Um, and you're basically using a large language model as the mutation operator. Um, and so like to, 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 to illustrate this in this paper, we, we said, okay, let's to take this domain soda race because we want something really visual, so it'd be easy to appreciate. And in soda race, um, that's about these like little 2D robots. They're basically usually designed by hand. But what we did is we, we created a Python interface to describe these things. And they could be described not just like as an enumeration of parts, they could even they could be described as a program. So you could have a loop that could like create, like for example, a wheel or something. In fact, on the right, there is a, a wheel was actually discovered by this thing. So it reinvented the wheel. Um, and, um, and so like that, that's interesting because the, there's no way that the, that the L large language model here uh, was pre-trained on uh, this data, on soda race data, because we just invented this thing. So it's like there's a soda race we didn't invent, but we invented this Python way of uh, coding soda racers. And so that data didn't exist before. And so like what's interesting is then we were able to get hundreds of thousands of programs for just like an insane diversity of these guys, and then actually find out like whether those were suitable for different terrains. Um, that's why we see these different terrains here later. We actually got uh, RL to learn how to output these conditionally using this training data that we generated to go to the evolution. Okay, so that's kind of cool. But uh, instead of just going through the whole thing, like how that works, which, I, which you could just read the paper, I wanted to focus on sort of a, a more subtle implication for open-endedness. Why does it matter to open-endedness? Um, you know, other than just, well, it's kind of cool, you could evolve like stuff like that's okay, maybe it'll be open-ended, but there's a deeper thing here. And I wanted to emphasize this point because it maybe it'll be thought provoking. Um, it is in the paper, but it's like kind of buried in there with a, all these other insights. And so it might not be a jump out as, as how significant it could be. So I want to emphasize this thing, which is really about something called detached conditional things or DCTs. And you've never heard of that unless you read the paper. Um, that's because I just made it up uh, before we wrote the paper, um, but I think it's an important concept. And so I wanna tell you a little bit about what it has to do with open-endedness. Now, with open-endedness, like I think one of the fundamental things is, at least it interests me a lot, is why we can't get something to stay open-ended forever. Like algorithms are proving, I would argue, in open-endedness, some from this very group, um, like from our from my work, like one example is poet. Um, so that's why I'm showing examples from from the poet algorithm. Um, 
But look, I put a brick wall on that graph just to just to depict it. Like there's basically a brick wall. We know this is going to end. Like in this example, like Poet was generating environments and agents to try to uh, to walk through these like different terrains in these environments. And these are neurocontrollers for these guys. And like, okay, well, Poet will like it could keep on going and getting more and more complex terrains. It's very interesting for a while. And so I call that weak open-endedness. Like it's for a while, it's actually generating new stuff and new solutions. It's just what you want to see. But the brick wall is coming and we can be sure of that because like this is finite. Like there's only so many interesting of these until it's the end, right? Um, and that, that's a property of the environment, not the learning algorithm. And so the environment is, I would say, always a brick wall. And always, I mean, so far, like every environment that's ever been invented for an artificial system is a brick wall um, that will eventually just close off the open-ended system and you won't see anything interesting anymore. I don't mean like that, like, it, I don't mean in the literal sense that like, or the theoretical sense that like you could never do anything different than what's done before. I mean, more in terms of like, there's nothing interesting to do. Like I could slightly shift these hills or something, but basically we've seen everything interesting there is to see at some point. Nothing fundamentally new is going to happen. So there's a brick wall there. This is why I think uh, we aren't seeing strong open-endedness, which to me means, and I'm basically coining these terms, but to me, it means that something that will really can go forever. Think about the implications if it could go literally forever, which would mean that it would be able to produce interesting stuff to us forever. The longer you run it, the better it is. Come back next week. It's better than it was last week. Come back next year. It's way better. Come back in a million years and it'll be absolutely profound. Like that, we don't know how to do that. And one, one problem here is this brick wall in the environment. And so it raises this question of what is the property that allows our universe seemingly to support what is truly unbounded open-ended innovation. Um, and, uh, and, and this is, you know, of course, you know, put a little asterisk and say, well, you know, at some level the universe might end or something, but look, evolution has been going on for a billion years. It's as close to unbounded as we really need to get to be pretty impressed. How is that possible? We cannot create any environment that has a property close to this. And I think this is a really interesting question from a machine learning perspective, because it doesn't really draw on any existing machine learning intuitions, which suggest low hanging fruit. You know, like there's like a lot of stuff that's been pruned out of pruned, like pruned really deep. Um, in terms of good ideas, like, like the way that we can exploit SGD, um, neural network principles, uh, you know, reinforcement learning principles, like we got built up intuitions over decades that are like really kind of like getting to, to really complex levels at this point and we kind of know what's there. This though, this is completely out there. It has nothing to do with any of that. And yet it's absolutely fundamental if you're gonna see something going forever. So what is it that's causing this? It's almost like a philosophical question. And so some people refer to this as the richness of the outer universe, like the, that our universe, like this non-computational non construct that we actually live in has this richness. Like, what is that though? What is richness? And why can't we put it into our computer? Well, like before having a hypothesis about this, I just wanna make an assertion that if you're gonna answer this question, I think we want this to be a, a, an answer that refers to high level abstract properties that would, that would define a broad set of possibilities as opposed to low level physical properties. The, the thing I don't like about low level physical properties is an explanation of the richness of the universe is that all it does is point back to the universe itself. And so like, you don't want the answer here to just be, well, you have to create uh, you know, like a completely, um, a completely accurate uh, re recapitulation of the entire universe, <laughs> then we'll be able to do it. Well, that's not what we're looking for here. We want high level algorithmic insights because we want a whole class of possibilities that includes the universe. We don't wanna to have to make things as complex as the universe and like reinvent quantum, quantum mechanics and relativity and these things like that has nothing to do with the algorithmic issues, hopefully. If it does, I think we're in trouble, um, but I don't see any theory, you know, philosophical reason to believe that's true. So. The hypothesis then, like searching for more abstract explanation that I have, is that it has something to do with universal expressivity, which is kind of interesting because that's, that's somewhat related to universal computation. You know, like there's something about this, our universe, the place where we, where we exist, that has this kind of universal expressivity. Um, and this is a little bit like the universal, um, uh, universal computation that we've seen something like a Turing machine. Um, and so, you know, universality and unboundedness are related. Like if there's a place that has anything that can be expressed, it's also a place where anything can happen. And, you know, computation is a metaphor for expression. Um, but the thing is that like, if, if there's an environment that we like to call them environments, I'm calling it a universe because I'm making an analogy with our universe. Like if there's an environment, then, then expression has to happen through some medium. 
In other words, like computation in a void is not really interesting to us. It's vacant, just computation alone. So there has to be a medium which goes beyond like normal theories, like like you know sort of a, a language complexity theories, because like the medium is not usually like part of the discussion. But this matters, of course, like when we get into actually expression of things, like like the like the physical reality. And so our universe, the medium is physical reality. So we have this combination of sort of universal expressivity and some kind of a physical reality or realization. Again, I don't, I'm not, I don't want it to be that we have to recreate physical reality. I want something more abstract. So we really want to abstract the universality that we have in this universe, which I could call U1, because it's like the first one, into some new universe, U2, um, that with some principle of abstraction and get that universe, universality out of it. And so why would that break through this brick wall? Well, I think the, the kind of... Uh, the concrete answer is that it leads to what's called invention, which means like, you know, if anything is possible, every end becomes a beginning. And so like, it just is a joke, but, is it, but it's, it still uh, sort of illustrates the point. Like if this little robot could actually invent anything it wants, like rocket ships, cars, of course, this, this, this domain just suddenly explodes in possibility. Um, it's a completely different situation. It becomes universal. Um, and that would then allow it in theory to be open-ended. So invention is like a way of actually allowing this expression to happen in some medium. And so, you know, invention, I think, is a key link between open-endedness and AGI. You know, at some point, evolution passed its baton um, to the juggernaut of civilization. Both are open-ended processes, but civilization is the expression of human intellect. Evolution is not. And the scope of our creations is also unbounded. This is what we currently are interested in. When we think about human level intelligence is what we're making, what's coming out of our heads. You know, look out the window um, and you'll see what the products of these things, like, and actually just look around yourself, everything is there. Um, and uh, the one, one interesting observation then we think about it, we get to the world of invention is that the vast majority of our intelligent output is detached from ourselves. Like the things that we're creating that matter here are not attached to our body. Um, and yet, RL, it often focuses on attached things like our body, uh, our limbs. How do they interact with this, what we generally think of as a mainly immutable environment around them? That will not have open-endedness because there will be no invention. The world will never change. And invention is the intersection of intelligence and open-endedness. It feeds on this infinite expressiveness because you can't have endless invention unless you have this unbounded expressiveness. This leads to the idea of this DCT. Like you could think of actions in like conventional reinforcement learning as attached conditional things. It's like, it refers to things that are attached to you like your legs, at least implicitly. Like Mario here, he's trying to control Mario. He should jump over this, this Goomba. And uh, that's about his attached conditional things. Like it's conditional in the sense like he decides what to do depending on what he sees in the environment. It is conditioned on the environment, but it's attached. But in, an invention is also an action. It's just that it's about things that are detached uh, usually. And um, it changes the outer environment and actually leaves behind an artifact that actually outlives often its inventor. And these detached conditional things um, are the reason that the output is unbounded. Our output is unbounded um, because the possibility for the DCTs are endless. So this you know, goes from Mario, be concerned with Mario to be having building a hoverboard. They can get off the hoverboard. You can give the hoverboard to someone else. Someone else can reproduce the hoverboard and so forth. And so the, the DCTs will lead to more DCTs and like a really kind of canonical example would be like a door and a key. Um, and so of course, it doesn't make sense to have keys if you don't have doors, but once there were doors, suddenly there's this opportunity to have keys, which is very interesting. Um, and now there's opportunities for new things because of keys and so forth and so on. We get lock picks and we're gonna go to combination locks and all kinds of new things, security systems, computational security systems. And this is because like DCTs are proliferating in this open-ended sense. Now you should keep in mind also the language itself is a kind of DCT. Um, it's, a, it's an artifact that's left in the world and can have ramifications and effects. So this new universe, uh, I would argue, needs universality so that the DCTs can proliferate in it. Now, the problem is that these things require, these DCTs or inventions, you could also say informally, they require some kind of API, like some interface to describe them. How does the agent that is putting these things into the world express what it should put into the world? And this API is basically like a language of description. Um, and the API of Earth, I would argue, sucks because basically particles in the ground. Like this is how we got all of our, almost all of our DCTs. Um, this is not great because it takes thousands of years to figure out. It's completely counter unintuitive. And it doesn't, it doesn't really, uh, it does not really designed at all to make things easier for us. 
Um, and so like, it's gonna take thousands of years to figure out what to do there. Now we can eventually get through that interface to something like computation. We built computers out of stuff in the ground. It actually happened, but it's not ideal. There's no reason you'd want to re-simulate that. Um, so in this other abstracted uh, environment, their universe U2, that AP API should be designed for neural networks, I would argue. So you get discovery right from the start. It should be something that's like not like dirt in the ground. It's like a very intuitive API from their perspective. Now, there are some things like this, like Minecraft command blocks. If you know this game, Minecraft, like there are these things called command blocks. They're like pieces of matter that actually can be uh, programmed. Um, and so, you know, that's that sounds like a lot of people, like if they hear this argument, like their mind goes to stuff like that, like, oh, we need things like that. I don't think so, though. That, that isn't really what I'm talking about because they're not really optimized for what I'm talking about. I think what we should think about is just efficiency, and that's all that really matters. Like the, 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 the Minecraft command blocks are evocative because they seem really cool, but from a computational perspective, they suck. You need like thousands, millions of them to do something really complex. It actually takes physical moving, which takes simulation through the world to put them into a configuration that's of any interest, which is extremely expensive uh, computation. It's 3D simulation just to configure your invention. Like that's not where we want to go. Like why should we make the agent do all of that when we could just tell us what it wants? And just instantiate it. There's no particular reason from a computational perspective that this is actually good. And so uh, eventually, uh, if we have a good API, when multiple agents are inventing in this new universe, and then uh, in reaction to each other with this kind of universal API, we could see unboundedness. This becomes possible because then we can get these cascades of invention. So what should be the API? Well, I would argue, and this now goes back to the paper, that programming languages are a pretty interesting candidate here for an API to towards DCTs. They have the right property. They basically are DCTs, They're detached conditional things. They were invented by us. They become detached from us. We're no longer necessary for their operation. They can describe anything, even physical things like the soda racer. That's what I mean by physical. It doesn't have to be literally physical. It'd be a simulated physical thing, but they can describe any structure you want and they can use like uh, loops and, and different structures to make those things recursion, to make those things have regularities that might be of interest to us like fractal regularity, what might you, what, whatever you might want. Um, they have universality, of course, that's basically what it's all about, universality of programming languages. Um, their natural format, uh, formal output for language model, large language models, I mean, that, that's basically the point, that's what we showed in the paper. Uh, and well, I mean, and it's been shown before, of course, to train language models to do programming. So it's very, this is a succession of DCTs and I'm not arguing we would recapitulate that. We won't see that happen again. What I mean though is civilization in the abstract sense is a process like this a proliferation of increasingly complex DCTs is basically what civilization is, that could be triggered. And so Elm, this, this, this method, I think, can provide a bootstrap into that possibility um, by generating all this data in whatever domain you think is proper to get into like some kind of DCT system, open-ended system. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ken. That was super uh, thought-provoking. Uh almost raising more questions and hypotheses and answers, I guess, but uh, that's exactly probably what our lab likes right now. Uh, 